Ah yes, the early 90s. What a glorious time to be alive. Despite poverty surrounding most of the UK's smallest towns, going for gold being repeatedly rammed down my throat every day on the BBC, and the fact that I was too old for Mother Goose and too young for Kim Bassinger, the gaming scene was buzzing with tension and excitement as the bit wars were heating up faster than one of my auntie's chicken vindaloos in an air fryer. Scores of kids and parents would line up to Dixon's or other electronic video game stores and put down their hard earned cash on the Super Nintendo or of course Sega's Mega Drive or Genesis for my American friends. Kids would gather in the playgrounds, swapping secrets about how to beat King Cooper in Mario World or trying to beat that final boss in Castle of Illusion. Before the existence of the internet, the mere mention of a tasty tidbit or in-game secret such as how to fight Reptile in Mortal Kombat was often spread via word of mouth or found in a vast array of video game magazines shining brightly in my local paper shop. Gaming had become huge and whilst I would get to play the SNES and Mega Drive regularly at friends houses, it was a few years before I would get to play them at home. It was hard not to get swept up in the staggering number of video games that were coming out though, despite not owning any of the systems, I would buy any gaming magazine I could get my hands on just so I could see how big gaming was becoming, wishing I could have got on the ride from the start. That's not to say I didn't have any gaming consoles in the house, I mean we had the Nintendo Entertainment System for a super long time, and playing it in some of its library was like someone had turned on this shining beacon of light, and that this was gaming and it was hard to imagine just how big it would get. Eventually we would also get the Sega Master System and it too was incredible and was really the only way I would get to play Mortal Kombat. And whilst it did the job somewhat I really wished I was playing a more powerful console version of it though. Eventually for my 10th birthday I received a Nintendo Game Boy which included Tetris and this was where compared to some other people my gaming journey was comprised of for a long time before finally getting my hands on the 16-bit systems. Eventually for Christmas and birthdays I built up quite a cool little library of games. I played the classics such as Super Mario Land, Nintendo World Cup, Link's Awakening, Kirby's Dream Land and whilst these were all good titles I would complete them very quickly and would often find myself looking for something new to play for my handheld. As I mentioned money was very tight and I would receive about £2 a day pocket money and so saving for that next big title was not impossible was just like many of those piss poor work party outings I enjoyed as an adult, I just couldn't be bothered and lacked any kind of discipline. Luckily for me at the time there was a solution to all my problems. Close to where I lived was a small shack which used to be a carpet shop and this is where I first encountered something called a swap shop. Now these swap shops were popping up all over the country. I stepped inside this small new store and felt like Link from Zelda as NES, SNES, Sega and Game Boy game boxes adorned the four walls. I glanced towards the man behind the desk and he had Street Fighter 2 playing on an old CRT television and had stacks and stacks of games left and right either side of him as well as a number of small drawers stuffed with gaming treasures. To me this was heaven and this guy was some kind of a god. It was thanks to this shop that I was able to play some classic games, take them home, complete them and swap them for others, rinse and repeat. I would play the games mostly to completion or when I got bored and trade them in for something else. I'm not ashamed to admit that again without the internet not being in existence to guide me I had no idea of what games were good or bad and so I played a ton of bad games as well as good ones. Whilst at the time a bad game would be frustrating, over the years I probably have more of a well rounded Game Boy experience than most people do nowadays as I got to play a lot of games for it. Well hold on ball bloke I hear you cry, why are you telling me all this, where's the review and where's that point that you owe me? Well this all ties into this review, as it was by swapping a Game Boy game that I stumbled upon a real gem I'd never played before called Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters. I knew absolutely nothing about it other than the artwork on the cartridge looked cool and just thought oh it's probably just another platform game. Boy was I in for a surprise. I remember the day quite well that I got my hands on the game. As me and my friend we didn't go to a regular school, we were rebels, troublemakers and pretty much the equivalent of Beavers and Butthead. Rather than send us to Borstal though, we were sent to a community centre for 2 hours a day to do our maths and English which meant we worked from 9 in the morning to 11 in the morning and then we would go home or I'd go round to his and we would play Super Nintendo or Game Boy non-stop, watch Nickelodeon, drink tea, eat biscuits and I would go home at 6. This particular day I remember an argument occurring between myself and my teacher, like I said I had a big mouth and we would butt heads quite a lot. 
I believe it was over some rubbish made for TV 90s documentary we were watching which had cows in it. I can't remember if I was bored or if I spoke when I wasn't supposed to, but my teacher told me to shut up. I ended up walking out of the classroom after calling her something which I really, really regret to this day. But anyway, um, I made my way home and me and my friend, we just thought nothing of it and we just went to the swap shop. And that's when I got Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters. I started playing instantly and it was love at first sight. My teacher, however, didn't forget what I'd done. She was a snitch and would tell my parents everything. Even if I sneezed wrong or disagreed with her in any way, whether I was right or she was right, whether I was wrong, whether she was wrong, she would just pick up the phone and moan to my parents. I swear she got off on it. Anyway, it was while I was at my friend's house that I was dragged home by family and left to face the wrath of my parents. And you know what? It didn't matter. It was like I was bulletproof. The power of Kid Icarus, the Game Boy and its world had got me so hooked that I could care less about being shouted at and grounded or being separated from my friend for a week. Yes indeed, reality was no match for playing as an angel tasked to rescue a beautiful babe from Orcos. Anyway, when the dust had settled and when I had done my penance, I remember starting up the game, discovering its rooms spread about its stage, its shops, its training areas, and this is one of my fondest gaming experiences. So fond that I even stopped watching the Dan Aykroyd Eddie Murphy comedy trading places just so I could complete a dungeon. I wanted to talk about this game in a different way because I know that when I normally do reviews they tend to be rather cheeky or rather funny but realised that uh, although I could do a review in that style a little bit and it would net me even more birds and social play on YouTube I would be glossing over the whole experience as I said this was a childhood game for me and helped me in times when I really really needed it so I decided to make a longer video which will go into a wee bit more detail of this underrated hit as well as being a, maybe a little bit Bit more cheeky and funnier. So anyway, let's head on over to Angel Land and let's have a wander with me on Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters for the Game Boy. The story is pretty straightforward as Wee Man Pit has been chosen by Goddess Palutena to stop a sensitive demon called Orcos, whom she foresaw in a dream would try and take over Angel Land. Orcos is essentially the devil, but well, I guess Nintendo didn't want to offend anyone and so renamed him, but yeah, essentially it's the devil, good old Beelzebub, Satan himself. Anyway, Wee Man Pit must work its way through several stages, training and levelling up for the big fight and must prove himself worthy of being able to use the three sacred treasures which are the only elements powerful enough to stop Orcos apart from Vanessa Feltz. Right off the bat the game seems to resemble a typical platform game where Pit destroys enemies, climbs upwards or forges a path to the right to the end of the stage. However this is where things take a slightly different direction. You see, you can't just play this game like a platform game and quickly rush to the end of each stage. I tried this without knowing what the hell I was doing, and all that happened was that I couldn't hold the three treasures because I didn't train enough. That's right, you have to train. So how does one train in this game? Well, you defeat as many enemies as you can on every stage to accumulate hearts, which are also converted to points. To make things even more confusing, your hearts that you accumulate are also your currency that you spend in one of the many hidden stores in this game. So you can kill up to 999 enemies on each stage and if you want to stand any chance against Orcos, I highly recommend farming for maximum hearts. So just to be clear, the game keeps track of how many enemies you kill. So for example, say if you kill a bunch of enemies and then you spend the hearts you've just accumulated from killing them in the shop, it's absolutely fine because although the counter says you have less hearts, the game still remembers that you killed the enemies and ties up the points at the end of the stage. Pretty handy I must say, although a little confusing when you're first starting out. I should also mention that this game has battery backup so you can save your progress at the end of every stage, meaning you don't have to beat it in one sitting. Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters is in itself a platformer that is fused with strategy and a wee sprinkling of RPG levelling up. Each stage contains a plethora of respawning enemies, multiple doors which include a couple of training rooms, one with bats in to help Pit earn some extra hearts and one with Zeus who is kind of like the video game version of Mickey Goldmill, putting Pit for a punishing endurance test of hard flying blocks. 
The whole point is to be able to endure these rooms by having enough health which comes from earning extra health blocks and this comes from training like a mofo and racking up as many points as possible which are then accumulated and generally I found that by getting maximum points on each individual stage my health would be increased every 2 to 3 levels. Anyway survive the training and Zeus rewards you by letting you choose from one or three items, a more powerful arrow, a force field or an upgraded bow. Also some rooms have Zeus reward pit with an arrow anyway. You must make sure you get levelled up as early as possible, it's very monotonous and no one feels like doing it, but if you want to stand any chance at getting Palutena back, welding those three treasures and finally ending the reign of Orcus, it's very necessary in order to win the day. There are some other rooms though, some just feature a guy who looks like the bloke from the Die Straits music video Money For Nothing giving you tips on hidden secrets. There's also spa rooms to restore health and also stores which will sell you extra health which works kind of like the fairy in a bottle from Zelda. There are barrels which allow Pit to carry more health bottles, hammers which allow Pit to destroy rocks to discover hidden doors and enemies. There are also keys which allow Pit to re-enter a door he has already been to. As after Pit leaves the room, the door becomes locked, and this is very useful if you've made an error or failed a particular room. It gives you the opportunity to try again. All of these things though cost hearts, hence the reason why you need to grab as many as possible. One room I need to mention though has these pots with question marks on them. If you can destroy them all in the right order, you can get a credit card. Yes, you heard me, a credit card. Even in Greek Roman mythology, credit scores were important. You can only use the credit card once though, and you can only use it in the second store, which features a few of the same items as the first store, but at a much more extortionate price. If you have the credit card, however, you can just pick one of the items and put it on Zeus's credit. No problemo. This means you won't be wasting hearts, but you can only use it once. Fail to guess the correct pattern, however, and Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo pops up to taunt you, and you lose some hearts. Also, each stage contains power-ups and hammers for Pit to collect. As I mentioned, hammers can be used as a weapon or they can be used to uncover hidden doors. You can also get feathers in later stages which allow Pit to be able to fly temporarily, which gives you a taste of what Pit will eventually be able to do when he gets the wings near the end of the game. So to summarise, this is where the strategy part of the game comes into play, where you need to visit these rooms and try and get the most out of them. This isn't easy at the start as Pit is as weak as a kitten. So again, try not to rush through, you'll only lose more lives that way if you do. Also, the levels are very strange in that they can scroll up, down, to the right and the left. It's almost like a mirror because you'll spot a door or area that's higher up on the left or right that you may not be able to get to, but if you go in the other direction, you will see the same area or the same door that you were trying to get to and there'll be a way to get to it. There may even be a lift to kind of help you get there. It's very bizarre. It's kind of hard to explain, but as you can see, you kind of get the general idea here. There are three worlds in all to traverse. The Underworld Tower, this is where Pit starts from. The Overworld, which is like the midway point, And the Skyworld Tower, which is towards the end of the game. And there's also a final level called the Sky Palace. Each of the three worlds also has a maze-like fortress or dungeon to explore, in which Little Pit must try and work his way through to one of three badass bosses who are guarding one of the three sacred treasures that Pit must collect. Once again, it's kind of like The Legend of Zelda. You can even buy pencils and a torch, which in turn helps Pit by giving him a map, and this lets him know the general layout. However, this is where the game gets very quirky. To get to the right area in these dungeons, Pit must allow himself to be turned into an eggplant to get through small gaps. Once through the gaps, he can then find a hospital room where a nurse will lift his curse and change him back. It was a great twist and very humorous. Now the three bosses that Pit will face on each of the three individual dungeons are so cool. There's a Minotaur who throws fireballs and can teleport to various parts of the boss room, making him a pain in the ass to take down. A truly difficult first boss if ever there was one. There's a Skullwing who can fly all over the place and just tends to drop firebombs. And you have to kind of move out the way each time and then attack him when you can. And then finally there's a Serpent who moves in a fast erratic pattern. The idea is to hit its head, but it's really really challenging, provided you have been training though and levelling up it won't take you that long to beat it.
After you've beaten all three bosses, Palutena may deem you worthy of welding the treasures provided you have trained enough. And then old Orcos pops down and kidnaps her, meaning Pitt has to do his best Liam Neeson impression and then works his way through one more stage with all the treasures before one of the most titanic boss battles in Game Boy history takes place, the ultimate battle of good and evil. Orcos, or the devil, attacks you as a tiny little demon flying and Pit needs to fly and attack him while also trying to avoid his fireballs. This is why I said you need as much health as possible. So make sure to collect a battle ton of reserve health and gain the maximum number of health bars which I believe is 5. Do this early enough and the game becomes a complete cakewalk as once you have maximum health and you go to more training rooms they appear to be empty. I guess Zeus has popped out meaning that you are the man. Anyway back to the fight. Orcos' first form is super annoying as he tends to try to stick to you and fire his fireballs from above but if you can just somehow stick and move and shoot the hell out of him multiple times he'll then disappear and then you'll face his second form. OMG, it's a giant Satan throwing bats and projectiles at Pit. Now this is one of the badass bosses I've ever seen in video game history. The idea here is to fly up and shoot him in the face, whilst taking time to try and avoid the projectile attacks. It does feel a wee bit slow, but trust me that old devil takes a ton of damage each time you fire. Again, just keep rinsing and repeating until he finally succumbs to Pit's laser arrows. I will say that the ending was kind of disappointing for me, don't get me wrong, it was awesome to finally beat Orcos, but all you get is a simple congratulations and Peter sends to the heavens as a hero. It's better than nothing I suppose, but once it's over there's nothing more. That's my only real gripe with the game, that there should have been more stages and dungeons I feel. After the third world I was really enjoying the world of Angel Land and I wanted the game to be as long as say Link's Awakening. I guess maybe that was wishful thinking on my part. I guess I was enjoying myself so much in this fantasy world that I wasn't ready to leave. That's not to say the game is bad, far from it, it's so cleverly layered with all of its elements and ingredients it uses and it can be finished quite quickly once you know what you're doing. I played for 3 hours straight and finished it all in one sitting, but the game was left wanting more. I guess on the flip side, I guess it accomplished what it set out to do which was to entertain me but also leave me wanting more. I couldn't help but wish for a much harder quest option or something. There are however loads of secrets in the game's levels from hidden doors, hint rooms and power ups which add to the overall experience so there is replayability. It's also worth taking your time to explore as the harder you work the more you're rewarded. 
Graphic Naked Icarus of Myths and Monsters looks very cartoony and there's an extraordinary amount of different sprites that are large and detailed and almost look hand drawn, particularly in the way that they move and are animated. It's easy to see how much effort went into them, plus each one attacks differently which goes to show that this was one game that Nintendo wanted players to be challenged more so than in a typical platform game. I mean Pit himself looks incredible and there's no blurriness that I could see and the camera works just fine keeping up with him, keeping Pit in view all of the time letting you know that he is the hero. I love the look of each stage with pillars in the background, thorns and even small pits with black harmful substance that damages our heroes. Later stages feature sparse outdoor areas with clouds and grass which help to alleviate any claustrophobia found in the first world. Yes indeed, the stage designs are big, bold, bombastic and very ambitious for an 8-bit title. Although some stages do look similar, no two play the same and feature a plethora of baddies for each fight. There are snakes, bats, there's creatures that keep respawning from the ground after dying for some reason and even Death himself makes an appearance and he can be found wandering around Angel Land mostly on uh, the higher parts of each level. I was very surprised that with everything that appeared on screen I didn't encounter any problems with slowdown and despite a bit of sprite flicker this game is one of the best examples of how the Game Boy could be well utilised. Although this is from 1991 you can see that the developers wisely were able to create a different look for each world and the rooms and dungeons were pretty much kept with a black background to differentiate from the main levels. Musically, this game features lots of memorable tunes which will get stuck in your head long after you've finished playing the game. The heroic pit theme found on the very first world is very much a musical earworm and fits the aesthetic of the gameplay well. It certainly helps motivate the player to want to try and fulfil Pit's destiny and fight for the game. I loved how when in a training room the music becomes much more sinister to fit with what's happening and after leaving the room the music goes back to being all nicey nicey again. I particularly enjoyed the World 2 theme with its relaxing tune which really helped me settle in and slow my pace down. The dungeon and boss themes I also have to praise, the haunting tones whilst trying to navigate Pit through a tough dungeon created a sense of tension I'd never really felt apart from playing Zelda, letting me know that something was waiting for me at the end of it all and when the boss music kicks in and the boss appears it was awesome. There's just so many earworms here and another innovative use of the Game Boy's very limited sound capabilities too. You know what boggles my mind how developers were able to do so much with very little? Honestly if there's a Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters soundtrack available, count me in. As apart from a handful of other titles I've played such as Donkey Kong Land, Kirby, Link's Awakening or Mega Man, I couldn't think of another more engrossing set of music that belongs in the same category as these revered classics. Overall, Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters controls really, really well. Um, I like the natural evolution of the controls where you go from jumping and then eventually you'll be flying through each stage. I had no issues and any mistake you generally make uh, is your own. I have to say that the game's highly engaging and once I learned the ropes, I found myself lost inside the boots of Pit, wanting to power the little guy up and take on the forces of evil. Again, farming for kills and hearts can be slow, monotonous and tedious probably meaning the same thing. There were times when I'd try and find sweet spots where enemies would regenerate and I could get the most amount of hearts, striving to get 999 on each stage, but then the banshee music would be playing all the time and all I could think of was, I just want to explore the level. Whilst you can choose where, when and how you destroy the enemies, I did find that when Pit was weak it was best to just stick to one safe spot at first and destroy enemies slowly. Unfortunately training is part of the game and that boredom you may feel at various times will turn to excitement as you earn extra health and new weapons. This game indeed can be hard I will say but the more you persevere the more you learn how to tackle it and develop some sound strategies for beating some of the tougher levels. Kid Icarus again is very short but it's a world you'll want to explore time and time again. The rooms, characters and Greek and Roman mythology were weaved very well into the game and being an angel fighting evil kind of made me feel like Peter Cushing's Van Helsing fighting Christopher Lee's Dracula. I look back on Kid Icarus and Myths and Monsters with fond memories. As I said right from the beginning, I had a hard time when I was a kid adjusting to many childhood challenges and growing pains. And it was the one time where I ploughed all my emotions into a video game which helped shield me from the negative situations I was in with my parents and my teacher constantly meddling. I learned sometimes that right or wrong, video games can be better than therapy. It drew me into a world where I was the hero and nothing else mattered except my imagination. Video games were the only thing I had where I could overcome any challenge. 
Despite sticking out that nasty community centre and eventually going on to college and university, despite my uh, troubled uh, experiences by not going to school, I reflect on those times strangely with happiness, but also a little bit of sadness, wishing I could have been a better student. And with the benefit of hindsight, I could see that my teacher, despite being older and immature at times, just simply wanted the best for me. I honestly wished I could turn back time and stop my younger self from giving her so much aggravation. But I guess rebellion is all a part of being young and discovering yourself and no matter what I went through, video games were there for me when those people in my life weren't. So when life had discarded me, video games were there to kind of pick me up, dust me off and say, hey bloke, it's alright, let's play a decent game and have a nice cup of tea. Thank you very much anyway for watching this review. I wanted to kind of do things in a different style because as I said, um, this game just invoked so many memories. It was going to be just a straightforward review, but as I said, it sparked off that time in my childhood when I was very unhappy, but then it came into my life and it just made things better and I think that's one of the reasons why I hold this game in a high regard today. Anyway, thank you so much and I will see you next time for another retro review.